Now let's talk about the quality factor of an inductor, which is a very interesting topic since the majority of engineers have a very superficial understanding of this. And I purposely started by giving you the quality factor of the resonator in the previous section so we can actually compare the two directly. So first of all, most of the times people will actually try to define the quality factor of the inductor neglecting parasitic capacitances that we discussed before. And that is true if you're modeling your inductor at low frequencies and if your inductance has a, at least a reasonably a large value. So if that's the case, then the previous parasitic capacitances that you saw can actually be neglected, which means now, by these assumptions, your inductor has turned into a simple RL circuit. And most engineers know how to define the Q of such an inductor very, very easily. The Q of this is actually defined by uh, calculating the magnetic energy you're storing, di uh, dividing the that by the power you're losing, and then there is this very famous equation that the Q is equal to omega LS by RS. Um, in fact, if you ask almost any RF engineer, tell me the Q of the inductor, just give me one answer, that's the answer they will give you, omega L by R. And that makes physical sense in the sense that if I basically change my resistance and I make my resistance um, I reduce, let's say, my resistance by a factor of two, perhaps by building a thicker metal, then it makes sense that my Q should actually increase by a, another factor of two. If you actually pay attention in this definition, you will find out that we're basically subtracting the electric energy in the inductor. Uh, in this simple model here, clearly there is no electric energy stored anywhere. Uh, but if you were to take a more complicated model, uh, most people will subtract the electric energy because they don't consider the inductance as a device that should be stored in electric energy. Any electric energy will actually go to parasitics, and so in that Q definition, that actually will be subtracted. But then the question is that some other people will actually say, no, I'm going to define the Q of the inductor exactly the same way as I had defined the Q for a resonator. So they will basically take the magnetic energy, add the electric energy, and essentially define a different Q. Yet others that have been trained differently will take the Q, uh, the famous Q equation that you see right here, and that the Q equation comes from uh, linear systems. Essentially, it based, it's uh, defined around the resonance frequency of a resonance system, and it's looking at how the phase is changing around resonance, and that's a third definition for Q. And that's where the complexity happens, because the vast majority of papers that are published out there will not necessarily tell you which Q definition they have used. So the hunting begins, <laughs> uh, trying to understand what, what is going on. First of all, before we dig a little bit deeper to understand what's happening here, again, this is by far the most popular one. So in the absence of any other information, most people will use this conventional Q. <coughs> but let's first of all compare um, the Qs to see essentially what results are we getting. First of all, the second, uh, the cues that I have here in those uh, green boxes, they're basically the same as long as we're talking about a second order system. So for right now, for our discussion, let's assume that they are basically the same, so I don't differentiate between them. So how do we calculate them? These cues are based on a resonant definition. So they're basically based on the definition of taking an inductor, putting some type of a fictitious capacitance, which I will call here ideal, and calculating this LC, Q, at resonance. And because this C is ideal, any Q that I will get out of that system will only be the Q of the inductor. So let me see this again. These last two Qs are based on the idea that I have a resonator. Here you can see that explicitly, there is some type of resonance. So the way I calculate this is by sticking an ideal capacitance in my mathematical model in parallel to my inductor, and I scan this capacitance to change my resonance frequency. For any given resonant frequency I want, I can basically calculate the Q using these equations. And because this is a numerical capacitor, it's ideal, any Q I get is really the Q of the inductor. So let's see the results here. Here's an, uh, the, the inductance example I was using before. It's basically a 5 nanohead inductor with a series resistance of 6.3 ohms. And here's basically the ideal uh, capacitance that I'm using there to scan 
And on the right hand side, you can see the conventional calculated Q. By conventional, this is the omega LS by RS. And this is the resonance method Q that you see up here. Now, as you might expect, at low frequencies, the Qs are roughly the same. And that is true because in both cases, I'm away from uh, the resonance, which is right here. And uh, this is a low, Q, low frequency approximation anyways. So it makes sense that the Qs are the same. But beyond that, they deviate, and they deviate significantly. The most important deviation actually happens right here at self-resonance. So, and they give you two totally different messages, and that's where the confusion actually begins. The conventional calculated Q gives you the signal that at self-resonance, the Q of the inductor is actually zero, which basically means that this inductor is useless. You just can't use it right there. On the other hand, the resonance method Q says, no, you actually have built a resonator that has actually a Q of 18. Q of 18 is not great, but it's respectable. It at least shows that this thing works. So the question is, which of the two methods gives me the right information? Um, I was actually stunned as a student to read two different books with two different messages. One message supporting the first viewpoint, that you can't use an inductor at self-resonance. The second book supporting the second viewpoint, that of course you can use the inductor. It has a Q of 18. So which one is correct and which one is not correct? Again, and it took me actually many years to figure this out myself, the answer is it depends on how you plan to use it. If you plan to use this inductor, for example, to build a filter, and you re literally need an RLC device, and the L is going to um, work by itself, you need to consider this method because you need a good inductor. But in many RFICs, we end up building inductors purely for the purpose of creating resonators. So if I'm going to create a resonator, if I'm going to always stick a capacitance right to this inductor right next to it, I don't really care about the Q of the inductor itself. I only care about the Q of the entire resonator. And because of that, I might as well use the resonant method because this Q it gives me absolutely no useful information of what I will see in real life when I basically utilize the inductor. So I want to close this pros and cons of different cues by actually saying that if you dig really deeply in that Q concept, you will find out that Q is a metric that as an undergraduate student you take as a given, uh, no questions asked. Uh, as a graduate student, you start getting confused. And as a professional, you realize that it's just a metric and nothing more than that. Uh, it only gives you an idea, and actually a fairly rough idea, of how good this device might be. But you really have to pay a ton of attention to how you plan to use it to find out if the Q you have calculated has any meaning or not.